call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Redefiners. I'm Hoda Tahoon, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates, and I am here with my fantastic co-host, Clark Murphy. Hoda, the band's back together. Good to see you. So good to have you on. Clark, today we're going to talk about an industry very near and dear to my heart, the hospitality and travel industry. And after the pandemic basically shut down things a couple of years ago, travel is back. And we can say that there are projections for the industry to be fully recovered in the next year to 18 months. Well, I think it's the same in the business. The Business Association said that 24, it'll be back to something like 1.4 trillion, heading to 1.8 trillion in a couple of years. And I have to say, ironically, as we talk about business travel, I've just landed in London. I'm here for a couple of days, heading back to New York. And you're on the road too, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. I just got here yesterday. I head to Vegas tomorrow. So yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say people are traveling again, full throttle. So our guest today is Tony Capuano, president and CEO of Marriott International. As CEO of the world's largest hospitality company, Tony's portfolio includes 8,800 properties around 139 countries and territories and over 30 brands. Marriott also has the travel industry's largest customer loyalty program with Marriott Bonvoy, which has 196 million members. 196 million? And growing and counting. And I'm sure some of our listeners on the program are very, very loyal Bonvoy members. So Tony joined Marriott in 1995 and was instrumental in its steady growth over the years, serving as group president, global development, design and operations services before he was appointed CEO. He also served on the board of directors for McDonald's Corporation and Save Venice, a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving the artistic heritage of the beautiful Venice, Italy. How appropriate that someone in the travel business is helping save Venice. Tony, welcome to Redefiners. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks for taking the time and, and getting off a plane or, or out of somewhere visiting to stay with us for a little bit. Going back to the beginning, You've been almost 30 years at Marriott. What, what got you in the hospitality world and what's, what's kept you there? What, what, what's it like to be in the hospitality world? Yeah, I ended up in the industry maybe a little by mistake. I, uh, my aspiration as a kid, I really wanted to be a fighter pilot and uh, uh, actually got a congressional nomination to the Naval Academy. Wow. Uh, but didn't meet all the criteria to be a pilot. And I, I wasn't sure I wanted to go to military school if I couldn't fly. And at the time, my father, who spent his career with AT&T, was commuting into DC, and he com was commuting with one of our neighbors who was the lead lobbyist for what is now AH in LA, it used to be the Hotel Motel Association. And I had worked in restaurants growing up, and he suggested I look at the hospitality school at Cornell. And so I really, I stumbled into it, but a month in realized I'd found my calling and just fell in love with the industry. Uh, I love the idea of, of industries focused on the service of others. Uh, I loved the global nature of the industry. I loved that it was an industry uh, where you could pursue virtually any passion, operations, food and beverage, legal, compliance, real estate development. And uh, that's what really drew me to the industry. And Tony, you took over as CEO in 2021 after such an iconic leader as Arne Sorensen, and you've talked a lot about him being both a mentor and a friend over the years. What was that transition into the CEO seat like for you? And what have you learned from that experience so far? On a human level, it was crushing. I, you know, as you point out, Arne, I think, was a generational leader, uh, but also just a wonderful human being. And so... All of us at Marriott, whether we work here or uh, business partners of ours, were just devastated by his, his uh, early passing. And, and um, so we were all trying to manage our, our personal grief over the loss of a, a mentor and in most cases a close and dear friend. Uh, we were also wrestling with what Bill Marriott has characterized as the most significant challenge the company's ever faced, and that was the pandemic. And if you, if you rewind back to the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, we were still uh, in a terribly challenging position in terms of the impact 
that the pandemic had had, not only on Marriott, but the entire sector. And uh, I think for companies of our size and scale and complexity, as you well know, the CEO transition is often a very well-planned, uh, thoughtful, orderly transition. And while I, I will be forever grateful for the quarter of a century I got to work with Arnie, uh, the, the necessity of a change in the, in the CEO job was unanticipated by all of us. Uh, and it was, in every sense of the word, the, the corporate equivalent of a battlefield promotion. Uh, sadly, Arnie passed away on a Monday. Uh, that week, the, our board of directors uh, executed against its succession plan. Uh, and a week later, I was announced as, as Arnie's successor as CEO. So I didn't have the benefit of the sort of orderly, lengthy trans transition that many newly seated CEOs benefit from. Uh, but I had some significant advantages as well as I took on the role. Uh, number one, as I said, I'd had the chance to work side by side with Arnie for the better part of 25 years. I had spent the entirety of my career being able to lean on the, the wisdom and the insights and the institutional knowledge of Bill Marriott who I'm sure we'll talk about, but I, I still talk to him weekly. And I inherited a leadership team that I have described as both long-tenured and battle-tested. It was, uh, as you know, it's one of the great benefits of Marriott is the long-tenured nature of our senior leadership. So this was a team that I'd worked with through uh, the impact of events like 9-11 and the Great Recession. And, and so I took great comfort that I was surrounded by such an extraordinary collection of leadership talent. And, and I've mentioned this before, but in the first 24 hours after the announcement, I also received something on the order of 20,000 emails from Marriott Associates from the world, essentially saying, tell us what you need. And so I did a Wall Street Journal interview the, the day of my appointment and, and one of the things I said was it would be a daunting task for a whole host of reasons, some of which I've mentioned, if I had to take it on alone, but I never felt that way. I had the, the ability to tap into Bill Marriott, who is arguably the, the most extraordinary leader in the history of our sector. Uh, I had this incredible leadership team that I'd worked closely with, in many cases for decades. And I had this army of hundreds of thousands of Marriott associates uh, who stood ready to help us work our way out of the challenges that had been created by the pandemic. And tell us a little bit about, you know, the advice that you would give, you know, other upcoming CEOs in that, you know, in a transition that they would be making into the top seat. Um, perhaps, you know, just from your perspective now over the last number of years, what advice would you give or just to other C-suite leaders in general as they ascend in their careers? I think the first two I would mention, uh, I feel privileged from having watched Arnie in particular, and those are really around the importance and the value of transparent communication and the ability to actually listen, to clear your mind, clear away distractions and engage and be an active listener in every circumstance. Uh, I'm quite certain you and many of your listeners have had the privilege to watch uh, one of the early communications that Arnie filmed in the early days of the pandemic. Incredible. And my guess is that's a video that'll be shown in business schools for decades to come appropriately. And I think that was, a for all of us at Marriott, a, a really powerful lesson on the importance of real, sincere, transparent communication, even in the face of a crisis uh, where we had no visibility into what the future held. And I think that that uh, importance of, of transparent communication has been something I have adopted and tried to emulate throughout my three, uh, nearly three and a half years in the role. I think similarly, when I think about all the beautiful tributes that were written about Arnie uh, in the days and weeks after his tragic passing, one of the things that struck me, very few of them talked about uh, what an extraordinary business person he was, and most of them spoke to his humanity. And I, I will forever believe that part of the reason people had such a deep 
recognition and appreciation for that humanity is he was an incredible listener. And, and all of us live in a world today where we carry around multiple devices that draw our attention. We get our news either from the crawl at the bottom of a TV screen or in 140 characters. And so our lives personally and professionally are filled with distraction. And some of the tributes that you saw written might have been from a guest who had a three or four minute interaction with Arnie in the Port Cachere, the lobby of one of our hotels. And the reason they felt that they had connected with him in such a meaningful way is for that short interaction, he cleared him his mind of distractions. And he looked them in the eye and he listened to what he had to say. He likely followed up on that conversation. And, and I, I fear, I have a daughter that just graduated from college. And so probably much to her frustration, I, I pour buckets of advice on her head every day. <laughs> One of the things I say is one of the opportunities you have to distinguish yourself is to be an active, engaged listener, because I, I fear it's a skill that is in uh, rapidly evaporating supply and, and um, it's incredibly valuable. And I have found it particularly valuable in this new role. So question again, many of our listeners will follow uh, strong leaders. You, you followed an iconic one. Did you feel with all of those tributes and emotion and your respect, you needed to go slowly to put your own stamp as a leader in the lengthening crisis of the pandemic? How did you find your own moment and your own reach and have still have respect? So maybe I'll answer that by telling you a quick story that I've not necessarily shared broadly. I, I told you I was uh, announced as the next CEO on a Monday morning. Uh, that Sunday evening, uh, Mr. Marriott called to tell me the board had appointed me as CEO. And, and as is always the case, he, he gave me incredibly powerful wisdom that evening. And he said to me, uh, no one wishes more than me that I could ask the world to stop spinning for a few weeks so that we could appropriately grieve the loss of our friend. He said, and you are going to have to figure out a way somehow not to ignore those emotions, they are natural and appropriate emotions, but to compartmentalize them a bit. And the reason you have to do that is tomorrow morning, 800,000 people are gonna wake up and put on a Marriott name badge. And they're gonna look to you to lead them out of this, this existential crisis that the pandemic has represented. And, and the gift he gave me that evening was uh, a, a way to sharpen my focus on the task ahead. You mentioned already you, you've had no lack of tests as, as have your peers, uh, whether it's 9-11, recessions, Y2K or not, uh, digitization, et cetera. We ask all of our guests whether they had a, a single or maybe one or two redefiner moments. Is there a redefiner moment in your career? I think there's been a few, actually. I mean, I... I rewind to my very first job coming out of Cornell, uh, which was Laventhal and Horwath when they were the premier hospitality consulting firm. And I was a uh, newly minted Cornell graduate, quite certain I knew everything there was to know. And I, I always recall I did the first draft of my first assignment, uh, turned it in to my boss on a Friday afternoon. You have to remember this was 1987, so we had no mobile phones, <laughs> no email. So I'm not sure he had a way to reach me until Monday morning. But I came in Monday morning, he called me into, my, into his office, and he said, tell me your plans. I said, that's an odd question, w what do you mean? And he said, well, if your plan is to continue working here, your work needs to be meaningfully better. Wow. And, and he and I are dear friends to this day, and I thank him all the time. I, I, you know, the trend, and the way he described it to me, I, I, these words always stuck with me. He said, when you're in college, you always have the option of taking a B. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, you might have an exam the next morning. All of your friends are saying there's a great party we should go tonight. And you have the ability to say, I know enough to get a B on the exam, I'm gonna go out. And he said, that's not the world you live in anymore. 
we're paying you, our clients are paying us, everything you produce has to be an A+. And you have to make a decision whether you're committed to generating that quality of work each and every day. And so very early in my career, that was a powerful redefiner uh, moment for me. I would say second would be the early days after 9-11, which was the first time maybe my confidence was shaken a bit about the stability and strength of the travel and tourism sector. And then certainly the unfolding of the pandemic uh, was maybe the most significant redefiner that caused us to think about every facet of our business because we had virtually no visibility into what we were planning for. Did we need to strengthen the balance sheet and enhance our liquidity to navigate a week, a month, a year, a decade? Was this going to last forever? And that was uh, that really challenged everything I knew about our company and our sector. Tony, let's take a moment and talk a little bit about Marriott's customer loyalty program, Bonvoy, which we mentioned has over 196 million members globally. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to report to you, uh, we're well over 200 million members. Oh, congratulations. That's fantastic. We enrolled our 200 millionth member in Dubai a month or two ago. Oh, that's amazing. So customer experience and customer loyalty go hand in hand, and they are the top priority for leaders, you know, especially in industries such as hospitality, where there's such a very high personal touch um, and approach to servicing the client. From your perspective, what are the keys to success when it comes to Bonvoy and how you deliver exceptional customer experience across your brands? I love to talk about Bonvoy because you could make a powerful argument that it is our most important brand. It is really the umbrella brand that pulls together a incredibly diverse portfolio uh, from the mid-scale sector through the luxury sector across, as you pointed out, 139 countries and territories. We learned a great deal about Bonvoy and what our aspirations for Bonvoy are as we work through the pandemic. So imagine having a program back then of, I don't know, 160, 170 million members whose principal relationship with us was their stays in our hotels. And suddenly they weren't traveling at all. And, and that really served as a catalyst for the company to think about what can and should Bonvoy be? What should our relationship with our members be? And, and one of the obvious conclusions from that, that reflection was if we limit the scope of the program to the earning of points and redemption of those points for hotel stays, then we've done our, our loyal members and our company a terrible disservice. The, the program is and will continue to evolve so that the relationship with those members is not simply a transactional relationship. It is a more emotional relationship. It's an aspirational relationship. It is a platform that helps people dream about all that travel can do for them, both personally and professionally. Even in the early days of the pandemic, we rolled out a uh, partnership with Dara and the team at Uber. And what did that do for us? It allowed us to enhance and expand the connectivity we had with our members, even if they weren't traveling. So all of a sudden they may have been locked down in their home or their apartment, but they were ordering Uber Eats. And every time they did, they were getting a note from us that reminded them they were earning points towards that dream vacation when the world opened back up. I love this concept of the dream, the dream, whether it's, post pandemic, or it's the dream of I need to get to the end of this year and take a break, whatever it is. One of the great brands you have is the homes and villas. And but you also have this gen AI matching service, I believe that is kind of an icon for you all uh, quickly. Every business is trying to find the role of technology in their business model. But homes and villas is one of the highest touch probably. So how do you balance technology high touch emotion, aspiration? So there's a lot there, I think, with homes and villas. So use the two of you as an example. I want to capture as much of your travel wallet as I can. 
And, and from where I sit, the way I do that is I create a travel ecosystem that never gives you a reason to look outside that ecosystem. It's part of the reason we've just launched a mid-scale platform, because there are members who either they're at a stage in their lives and their careers where um, affordable, high-quality uh, lodging is most important to them. Maybe for certain aspects of their travel, that's important to them. I didn't have a, an offering in mid-scale, so I was giving those members a reason to look outside the ecosystem. Similarly, particularly during the pandemic, one of the things we heard was there was a big pickup in multi-generational travel. And I'm as loyal a Marriott customer as there is, but if I were planning a multi-generational vacation, I think about the prospects of success of calling one of our resorts and saying, I need eight connecting rooms. That would be difficult to offer in many of our hotels. So the launch of Homes and Villas, again, gave another uh, product so that that customer for that very specific trip purpose felt no need to look outside the Marriott ecosystem. On technology, the pace of technology evolution is shocking, uh, but it's also very exciting. And I often get questions, are you excited about the, the ability of technology to replace uh, associates, to replace jobs? And I say, well, while there will certainly be some measure of efficiency that comes from technology, we're in the people business. And what I'm most excited about from all this technology evolution is the capacity that it will create for our associates to better engage with our guests. I think the last thing you mentioned, Clark, was AI. And, and we and most travel companies have used AI in, in a variety of, of areas of our business for a while. What's exciting to me is AI can be such a powerful enabler to our industry leading scale. And what I mean by that, just a few months ago, I was in Cork, Ireland at one of our customer engagement centers. And one of the things I did during my visit is I wore a headset for two hours and I listened in to calls. And it was an rem important reminder to me, our guests and travelers in general have become so much more sophisticated. And I actually came back to our technology team and I, I shared with them a recording of a call and a guest called in and said, I'm planning a three generation trip. Uh, so here's what I'm looking for. I want a beach resort. I'm gonna need at least three two bedroom suites. We like Italian and Japanese food. So we'd like a resort that has an Italian and a Japanese restaurant. Imagine without the, the benefit of technology like AI, trying to sift through a portfolio of nearly 9,000 hotels. At best, it would be frustrating to that caller the time it would take to do that. With the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning, I can answer that response almost instantaneously. Tony, on this topic of, you know, investing in technology, there's a current battle, of course, for talent, executive talent that brings that expertise in AI within a lot of the tech companies. And I know that the hospitality industry is, you know, going out there and vying for that talent as well. And in many instances, this talent, you know, is very expensive, million dollar packages. Um, I think we've seen some creativity from, from companies who are trying to recruit this type of talent and getting creative with accelerated stock programs and many other perks. How is Marriott competing to get some of that best technology talent out there and bringing in that AI expertise? So I might give you a broader answer because it most certainly applies to high demand sectors like technology, data security. But I think the advantages we think we have in attracting that talent apply across every facet of our business. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, I have a, a daughter that just graduated from college. And so I did lots of um, non-scientific research with her classmates about how they think about uh, who they want to work for and why. And there seem to be very consistent themes, all of which will be familiar to both of you. I think it starts with a, a 
deep-seated desire to align with employers whose values match theirs. I think it's critical. And I think one of the, the things I treasure about our company is for nearly a century, we've been guided by the five core values created by our founders. And, and they are not flowery language in an annual report. They are fundamental principles that guide how we conduct business all around the world. So I think that's extraordinarily valuable. I think our commitment and our demonstrated progress on, in areas of DEI are invaluable. Uh, these are our uh, ambitious uh, associates or prospective associates uh, at all levels of the organization. And they often look to the position they aspire to have someday. And they say, is it filled by somebody that looks like me? And I think our commitment and our progress in those areas is extraordinarily valuable. And then I think it's a bit of storytelling. The travel sector is a remarkably compelling sector. Notwithstanding some of the hits it took in the early days of the pandemic, uh, we did a senior leadership meeting a couple, maybe two years ago. And as part of that, I interviewed Mr. Marriott. And I said, we've got our leaders all around the world. They are um, trying to fight their way through so the, the extraordinary challenges that have been created by the pandemic. And, and what words would you have to, to energize them as they gear up for helping the company fight its way out of these challenges? And, and uh, he got a big smile on his face and he said, it's a fun business. He said, Can you imagine spending your whole life working for a box manufacturer? But his point was this, if we're doing our jobs well, we are woven into the fabric of people's lives. Just on this, let's, we're going to stick with your daughter for a second. I have three 25 and 26 year old daughters and um, they're in the same mode. How they want to do things, they're less oriented about maybe buying something or consumption than having experiences. One of my daughters just was, was climbing in the Moab over the weekend. Um, she lives in Denver. How do you look at the Gen Z? How do you look at the next traveler who maybe is the third generation of that trip you talked about, but they're soon enough going to be making their own trips? How, we, how are you going to cater to them differently or the same than you have uh, in the last 20 years? Well, it's something we watch closely because it's so impactful to our business. And uh, we have big credit card relationships with both J.P. Morgan Chase and American Express. And on the long list of benefits of those relationships is they have incredibly rich data on consumer spending. And in a pre-pandemic world, to your point, Clark, the younger generations, we had already seen a very significant shift from spending on hard goods to experiences and travel. What's interesting as we look at a post-pandemic recovery world, it feels like the pandemic really accelerated that mindset across generations. So it's no longer just that Gen Z traveler. Really, every demographic that we serve, they learned during the pandemic that they didn't buy another watch or another pair of shoes or another handbag, but they most certainly missed traveling the world. One question that, that we all see it, it, when we're in a hotel, sustainability, the towel on the, on the hook, the towel on the floor, soap, water, power. You go to Europe, put the card in. In America, you may not put the card in. Lights on and off automatically. How does Marriott, with, with all of these locations, think about sustainability at scale and for Clark Murphy going back to his hotel room in London tonight. You know, I've talked about uh, uh, cel us celebrating our 97th anniversary this year. And I've talked a little bit of our core, about our core values. One of those core values is said quite simply, serve our world. And so 97 years ago, our founders had a view that one of the ways to build a, a successful business is to be an active, engaged, contributing member of the communities where we work. So nearly a century before someone coined the acronym ESG, we had a multi-decade head start on being that active, um, positive impact on the communities where we do business. Uh, it has much more focus on a global scale now. Uh, we've made very significant commitments 
uh, including a commitment to be uh, net zero by no later than 2050. Uh, our science-based targets, both short and medium term, have now been approved. We're the largest uh, travel company to have achieved those approvals. Um, and so it, it really permeates every bit of our business. Um, of course, climate is critically important, but it goes well beyond that. You look at what we've done on the elimination of single-use plastics. You look at the initiatives we've rolled out on a global basis to try to eliminate food waste. Forty percent of the food that is, is prepared globally ends up in the trash. And hotels and restaurants are one of the, the sectors that can be most impactful in thinking about proactive, deliberate, consistent methodologies to dramatically reduce food waste. And so it... The short answer, Clark, is it's embedded in our DNA. For nearly a century, we have been working to contribute to the health and vitality of the communities where we do business. And today's and, and tomorrow's efforts on, on sustainability are just a continuation of that, that multi-decade commitment. Tony, we've loved the conversation with you. And as our listeners know, we like to end each podcast with something that we describe as rapid fire questions to get to know you even better. Uh, this is where we get to ask you a series of questions and you respond as quickly as possible. Are you ready? Fire away. Okay. What is your favorite city to visit? Florence. Love that. It's my favorite city as well. Okay. Besides kind of clothing and toiletries, what are some of your packing essentials that are you? I always bring uh, kind of old school Bose headphones, and I always bring at least one actual physical book. I love that. So, Tony, we did a little research and saw that your Mother's Day post on LinkedIn a few years ago talked about Italian cooking. What is your favorite dish? Oh, my goodness. That is a tough one. I would probably say... Wild boar pasta from Tuscany. Wow. Okay. In Italian, they call them uh, shinjali, pappardelle shinjali. What's a leadership lesson that took you a long time to learn or act on? Not being afraid of being vulnerable. The Paris Olympics are going to take place this summer. If you could play any Olympic sport, which would it be? Uh, I'm pretty sure this will never happen, but I would say uh, basketball. And what's one piece of advice you would give to a new first-time CEO? Don't be passive. Uh, trust your instincts, particularly on matters of human capital. Be bold and be decisive. Listen, Tony, this has been fantastic. Uh, we are very appreciative. A lot of lessons learned for us uh, and for our listeners. You know, as we take away, we think a little bit about you and Marriott it's, it's dreams being realized, it's emotions being felt, and it's aspirations being achieved. The, the dream through travel uh, is really what it is about, milestones of life and promotions and children and engagements and marriages, that you're, you're helping people see their aspirations actually happen. Uh, and, and for something as large scale as you all are, it's all about people, and that comes from both Bill, Bill Marriott and from Arnie Sorensen. And you talked a lot about in, as you being a great leader and what you'd learn is the importance of transparent communications, active listening for your daughter as well as for you. And that Arnie helped you realize speaking to humanity is what creates bonds of people, whether they're guests or their associates of the 800,000 people, as Bill Marriott said, that put on the Marriott badge every single day. Your ability and the, what you learn from is the ability to focus in the moment is one of the aspects that makes leadership so strong and so important, particularly at Marriott. But some of those learnings for you go back straight out of Cornell. Um, I'm going to take this home, I got to tell you, to, to my kids. Uh, in the college, you have the option of taking a B in business and certainly at Marriott, every day is an A plus or you flunk the test. And finally, as a leader, back to you is values that the value system of Marriott has lived through 97 years, through your tenure of almost 30 years, and now are articulating to your daughter or to guests that these values live in the modern age and that that will be recognized, whether it's Gen Z or others. 
um, and your storytelling, what I hear is that work can be joy, right? These milestones of life, the gratification of being in the hospitality business is what keep, keeps people excited. So thank you for helping our visits count and the person you'll never talk to visits count or the Arnie moment in the hallway that makes it count because dreams are realized, emotions can be felt, and how wonderful that aspirations can be achieved if you're coming to see Marriott. What a great discussion. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Tony.